Good evening and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Wesley Whitaker and I'm one of your Ath Fellows this year. Before the life-changing combination of Spotify and an aux cord was invented, my mother and I used to listen to the radio whenever we were in the car. I grew up in Colorado, so whenever we went up into the mountains, the terrain created dead spots where tuning to our ra favorite radio stations would only produce static. At this point, I'd start scanning through the channels, trying to find a strong signal because I dislike silence almost as much as the sound of static. Almost every time this would happen, I would eventually come to a radio station that came in loud and clear, and it was always a Christian devotional station, rocking hymns about Jesus and his disciples. When I asked my mom why this was, she said maybe it's because God has no dead zones. Now, I, I, w I was not raised a Christian. In fact, my friend once insisted that I go to church with him, and he got very frustrated with me when I asked him if this boring man at the front of the room was going to be done talking soon. So I never, uh, it's safe to say I never really understood what these songs were fully about but I did appreciate their lyrical nature. I felt that it added a layer of excitement and engagement that listening to sermons did not. And you don't have to explain this to any believer or really any human who's been around this kind of uh, media. There's something unique about the performative and recitative elements of expressions of faith that is essential to understanding the religion behind it. And tonight our speaker will be ad addressing a different tradition of worship, the Ginans, which are hymns of wisdom from the South Ismai Ismaili communities. He will examine how they have been impacted by various social, political, and religious influences in colonial and post-colonial South Asia. Ali Asani is professor of Indo-Muslim Indo and Islamic, relation, Islamic religion and cultures at Harvard University. After attending high school in his native country of Kenya, Asani started his career at Harvard first as a student where he graduated with a concentration in the comparative study and religion of religion and later received a PhD in 1984 after working for the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. He has taught at Harvard ever since, serving as a member of the faculty for the Sanskrit and Indian Studies and African and African American Studies departments. In addition, he served as the Associate Director of the Prince Al-Walid bin Talal Islamic Studies Program at Harvard from 2010 to 2016. His courses and publications focus primarily on Shia and Sufi devotional traditions, as well as popular forms of Muslim devotional life and Muslim communities in the West. Since the attacks on 9-11, he has been active in improving the understanding of Islam through conducting workshops for educators and speaking at public forums. For this work, he was awarded with the Harvard Foundation Medal for his outstanding contributions to improving intercultural and race relations. Professor Asani's Athenaeum presentation is part of the Devotion in South Asia series, co-sponsored by a curricular development grant from the Dean of Faculty's office at CMC. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. Please silence and put away your mobile devices at this time. And please join me in welcome, welcoming Ali Asani to the Athenaeum. First things first, I need my notes. Yeah, so, um, well, first of all, I am so, so pleased to be here. Um, I've heard about this institution all the way across the other coast. Um, and, um, and then when I received the invitation to come here, thanks to Professor Velji over here, um, I immediately jumped on it and said, absolutely, I want to go there. So, um, so my presentation, there's going to be some, you know, audiovisual songs and things that I'm going to going to play, um, and I'm going to talk about. But I wanted to just just as to start to give you an orientation, uh, in case you haven't taken uh, any, if you have no prior knowledge at all of what I'm talking about. Um, first, the word Ismaili. So most of you are aware that in um, in Islam, there are two major groups, uh, denominational groups, the Shia and the Sunni. And the Shia are a minority group, so about 10% of the world's Muslims are Shia, and I would say about 90% are Sunni. And depending on the part of the world you're in, so Shia are not always a minority, so in certain parts of the world like Iran, certain parts of Iraq, Pakistan, uh, Central Asia, there are areas where Shia are a majority and Sunnis are a minority. So amongst the Shia, there are various groups. I was going to show you the slide to show you the number of groups that are amongst the Shia, but then I thought it would be too confusing, so I decided, because even historians find it con confusing to keep trace of this, so 
basically, so there are two groups amongst the Shia themselves. There are groups, uh, one group is called Itna Ashari. There have been 12 -er Shias, meaning they believe in 12 Imams after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. And then the 12th Imam went into occultation. Um, and this is the type of Shiism that you find predominantly in Iran today, as well as in Iraq. And then you have another group amongst the Shia who are called the Ismailis. And the Ismailis are a minority within the Shia themselves. So we are talking about a minority within a minority. And the Ismailis were um, the initial sort of crystallization of this group happened in 765 when one of the Shia Imams, Jafar Sadiq, passed away and there were disputes as to which son was going to inherit this office of being the imam, the, the leader of the community. And those who followed the son Ismail eventually became to be called the Ismailis. Um, and uh, the Ismailis have had a long history. And today there are uh, you know, many splinter groups among the Ismaili, but the one uh, there is one group amongst the Ismailis who are called the Nizari Ismailis, who are going to be the subject of what I'm talking about, who have actually a religious leader, uh, Karim Aga Khan, who is the 49th Imam. It is, he's seen as a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, direct from the Prophet Muhammad's daughter, Fatima, and son-in-law, Ali. And this is the only Shia group today that actually has a imam who is uh, well known. There are other Shia groups that talk about imams who are in hiding and will, or in occultation and who will manifest themselves as messiah type of figures. Anyway, so that's a little bit by way of orientation of what we are talking about here. Now here's, so this Karim Aga Khan Normally it visits the community in many different parts of the world. Today, Ismailis are scattered in 25 different countries of South Asia, Central Asia, uh, Africa, and also increasingly so in the United States and Canada and so on. And especially in Canada, it's a very strong community. So the Aga Khan was invited, for example, a couple of years ago to address the Canadian Parliament. And the Aga Khan also has a partnership with the Canadian government to create a global center for pluralism. How do you create pluralism within society? Anyway, so that's a whole other story. So in his religious capacity, he visited Karachi in the 1960s. And, there, and in one of the gatherings that he had with his followers, who he refers to as his spiritual children. So it's a kind of a certain religious language. So in this gathering, he says, many a times I have recommended to my spiritual children that they should remember ginans, that they should understand the meanings of these ginans, and that they should carry the meanings in their hearts. It is most important that my spiritual children hold to this tradition which is so special, so unique, and so important. And these ginans are these hymns that are sung. And before he went to uh, Pakistan, he had gone to Bangladesh. And there, he talked to the community there and saying basically the same thing about the ginans, but he designated the ginans as a wonderful tradition. Um, and and again, the theme that this is a distinctive heritage that the community should preserve. And it's distinctive to Ismailis who live in South Asia. Right? So Ismailis in other parts of the world have other literary traditions. Now, so where does his word Ginan come from? The common sort of derivation of it is it's from this word that has a Sanskritic origin, Gyan, which means knowledge. But what kind of knowledge are we talking about here? How is it using the term knowledge? Um, and there is uh, one verse actually from one of these Ginans which says, 
recite the Gnans as they are full of light. And, and boundless will be the joy in your hearts. So what kind of knowledge are we talking about here? It's not discursive knowledge. It's not intellectual knowledge. It is knowledge that comes from reciting something and hearing something and something that gets to your heart. So it's emotive knowledge. And some people would say it's also um, as part of the emote, emotions that it invokes, the emotions can also be transcending, meaning in the sense that sometimes, and we will talk about it in a, in a few minutes, that people feel a sense of transcendence when they hear this, and they feel they connect with the divine. So this is like very powerful poetry for the people who practice it. They see this as something that helps them transcend the material and connect with the divine. And just to give you a story that is repeated within the community many, many times over, of this individual, uh, Ismail Ganji, and you see his dates here. He, was, he lived in a small, uh, what later on became a, a princely state, Junagadh in Western India. And the story with him is that he was uh, really the, the rogue of his family. He was the black sheep. People, his parents disowned him, disreputable character, and so on. So one day, he went to the Jamaatkana, which are the Ismaili places of where they get, gather for ceremonies, and he heard a Ginan being recited. And there were a couple of verses in there that had such a great impact on him that he broke down into tears. And people were really shocked because this is like the tough gangster person on the street, and they see him just, you know, sobbing. And then he sought forgiveness for his sins, and that was the turning moment for him. And after that, he so reformed his life that he actually became the chief minister of the state of Junagadh. So he rose to power and fame. And then he used that position actually to help a lot of people. But it all comes down to that one or two verses that he heard. So this gives you a sense of the power of, uh, of, this, of this poetry. And we will actually listen to some examples. Now, in terms of where did these things come from, uh, the traditional narratives in the community is that they were composed uh, starting from the 13th century all the way down to the late 19th century by various individuals who were either called peers, uh, and peer is, um, uh, means somebody who, I guess I wouldn't call them saint, but you know, a saint-like figure. And these were people who were endowed with spiritual knowledge, enlightenment, and experience, and then on the, on the basis of this, they composed poetry. And the poetry was to be sung. It wasn't just to be read, it had to be sung in certain melodies and things. So it connected with, in a way, with other Indian traditions of music and performance, which is very important when we, as we'll see later. And so you have these periods, the great composers are called the peers, and then you have a period from 1500 to 1850 where you get individuals, at least within this tradition, who are considered to be not of a higher status as these peers, but at the status of Sayyids, which is like a second rank, but they were also composing. And in all, they're said to be about over a thousand pieces of these compositions. And uh, some of these, uh, I was, when I was an undergraduate at Harvard, actually uh, in my sophomore year, um, <clears throat> I met a professor who was asking me about these Gidans, and I was familiar with the Gidans, but then realized that nobody had done any work on them. Very little work had been done on them. So this is how I started getting into this field and slowly investigating its history, its impact, and so on. Um, and you know, much to my surprise, I ended up actually founding a whole field of studies that didn't exist before. So this was a very interesting opportunity for me. Now, so one of the things that I looked at was these individuals, like for example, this individual, this Pierre Shumps, who's on the list here. Um, let me see if I can find his 
see if I can get the pointer. Yeah, this individual here. Um, he has a mausoleum in, in Multan in Pakistan, and so do some of the other figures. But if when I went to visit this place to try to find out about who this Pir Shams is, everyone had a different story. Some people said, oh, here's the Pir Shams who influenced Rumi, the great mystic. He was Rumi's great teacher. Some people said, oh, he was just a, uh, he was a, he was a Sufi. And some people said, no, he was a Sunni Sufi. And some people said, no, he's a Shia Sufi. And some people said he's an Ismaili. So all his like, contested identities. And actually, what you see in the entire tradition, even as we will see with the Ginans, this tradition itself has developed in such a way, had such a pluralistic ecumenical outlook that different groups appropriated it and then claimed it for themselves. And so like you have this figure of Pir Shams being claimed by various communities. Now, while we are calling the Ginans Ismaili today, the term Ismaili does not even appear in the Ginans, which is a very interesting thing. Um, and the Ginans talk about what they are preaching. They call it Satpant, the true path. And Pant, for those of you who are, who are familiar with South Asian devotional traditions, is a very common term that is used to indicate a group uh, uh, people who are following the path that's preached by a certain uh, guru. So for example, uh, those who followed Kabir, this great mystic, are called Kabir, followed the path Kabir Panth, and they became Kabir Panthis. Dadu, Dadu Panthis. And then you have this Nanak Panthis. And Nanak uh, was again one of these great mystics. And eventually these Nanak Panthis evolved and became Sikhs. So today, Nanak Panthi is actually the, is now the name of a religion. It started out as a following of a particular individual and then evolved over time and become an ism, Sikhism. And I think the same thing happens with the Sat Panthi. It, as over time, the identities change, as notions of religion change, it becomes an ism. So today, now we identify it, Ismailism. So I've written actually a paper from Sat Panthi to Ismaili Muslim but showing how identities change over time. But the literature itself doesn't use the word Ismaili. Another very interesting thing about the Satpanthis, so so far, that there are many different groups amongst them. I've just put in some few names here, Kojas and Momnas and Shamsis. But what is interesting about these groups is that they are divided according to caste, in terms of profession, like Shamsis are goldsmiths and Khojas are traders, and Momnas are agricultural workers. So they're sharing this literary tradition, but they're divided amongst themselves along the caste system. So you can see how India's hierarchy, social hierarchy, starts playing itself out even within this particular group. Um, and then uh, I'm not going to go into this later, but some of these identities get reformulated. So in the pre-modern period, these people are seeing themselves as caste, in the modern period, they become religious groups. So some of these groups, the Satpanthis, become is Nizar Ismailis, some call themselves Twelver Shia, some call themselves Hindus, some call themselves devotees of Ramdev, and so on. So they've splintered their identity into many religious denominations. So now if you look at what is this Satpant, the path that was being preached, and I've identified sort of four discourses within that. There is what I would call an Ismaili discourse, a Sufi discourse, an Indic discourse, but also a Quranic discourse. So I'll say a little bit about what I mean by each of this. Now, the Ismaili discourse is trying to connect. So this is the region where the Ginans were composed in this area here, Sindh, Punjab, Gujarat, Rajasthan. And they use many of the languages of this region. And many of the compositions talk about that there is this, um, the imam or the, the spiritual guide lives to the west in Iran. 
And in fact, the story goes that some of these peers were sent by this imam, the religious leader in Iran, to South Asia to preach to people the Ismail, the, the Satpant path. And so, so by the Ismaili discourse, I mean this acknowledgement that there is an imam somewhere in Iran who sent messengers or guides and to preach a particular path. And so all those references about who that guide is, but this guide has many identities, as we'll see. He's represented in many different ways. Um, so in some of the Ginans, the terminology that is used to describe what the Satpanth is, it's using vocabulary that's totally Sufi from Islamic mystical traditions. So the term peer is also used for a Sufi master. Um, murid, a disciple of a Sufi master, you'll find these Ginans using that term. One of the goals of the Satpan tradition is that it's a, it's, a, it's a tradition of spiritual transformation. And what you want at the end of that spiritual trans transformation, you want enlightenment, spiritual enlightenment, to experience the divine. And that experience is, uses the term, that it's used the term didar, uh, which means vision, but sometimes they also use a Sanskritic term, darshan. Um, and this notion of light. And in a way, it resonates with a very famous journey that the Prophet Muhammad is said to have taken to the seven heavens and had this face-to-face -face meeting with God. It's allusions to that. So there's this very strong Sufi type of discourse within that. So no wonder people like Pir Shams will be considered to be Sufi. Um, and in fact, one uh, a Russian scholar, Ivanov, said that some of this poetry that is composed, you can't, he just called it Sufic or Ismaili style. You just can't distinguish where Sufism starts and Ismailism ends and where Ismailism ends. And so he said it's all confusing, these labels don't work. Then you have another discourse in here, Indic discourse. There's a Vaishnavite, the Vaishnavite are followers of devotees of the Hindu deity Vishnu the sun tradition and the bhakti tradition. And I think some of you are already familiar with this, so I won't go into this in too much detail. But the key to this is that in the Vaishnavite tradition, there's a belief that the deity Vishnu takes on avatars, different forms, and comes into the world, always to rescue the world from evil and restore justice. So there are nine of these avatars and Buddha was one of them, Krishna was one of them, Rama was one of them. So they're waiting for the tenth one, the Kalki. What you find in the Ginans is this tenth avatar of Vishnu is identified with the Shiite Imam Ali. And he's called Nakalanki, the one without any blemish. So you find a very interesting sort of mixing, a reframing of theologies there. And the Quran is identified as a Veda, using the Indian word for scripture, of the current time, the Kali Yuga, which is supposed to be the age of evil. We live in an age of evil, by the way, in case you didn't know that. Previous generations lived in an age of great righteousness. All right, so in the Ginans, you find an identification of the Imam with an, as an avatar of Vishnu, He's a Sufi master, he can lead to enlightenment and so on, and he lives in Iran. And he's a descendant of the prophet, right? And then, to make things even more complicated, you have discourses from another Indic tradition, the Sant tradition, which was basically a tradition that, uh, as represented by Kabir, that was against religious hierarchies and people claiming authority on how religion was to be interpreted against the Brahmanical, the priestly class, against the Qazis, people who claim authority in the name of religion, and who claim that salvation was only the privilege of a few. This group said no salvation, enlightenment, is possible for anyone, and that the truth is within. You need to have a guru, a guide, who will guide you on the meditation, and anyone, regardless of your caste, if you find the right guru and you meditate, you will be enlightened. 
And naturally, this was seen as a kind of, a, some people have seen it as a kind of socialist movement. But the language of this tradition you find in the Ginans as well. And then you have another tradition, the bhakti tradition, again, the tradition of devotion, piety to a particular uh, a deity, where you imagine the deity, it's always the soul. The soul is represented as a woman longing for the divine beloved. So one of the most famous of this was, of course, the Krishna legend, where Krishna was the symbol of the divine beloved whom all these women's souls were longing to get united with. And so it uses this, this longing, yearning expressions of love to talk about Krishna and other deities. It's also critiquing caste systems. But interestingly, in the Ginans, you find this language as well. And then you also have references to the Quran in the Ginans, because the Ginans are written in these vernaculars. But I've just given you some uh, uh, examples. We, do, we don't need to go over all of them. But it, it talks about, for example, here, that you know, evidence for what's being taught in the Ginans is found in the Holy Scripture, the Ved, the Quran. And it's using, again, the Indian term for scripture. Um, another very interesting one, this one here, this is a Gujarati verse. And there's a genre of the Ginans, they're called Garbis. Garbis are, those of you are familiar with Diwali and so on, you know, people dance around in circles. So this was a form of religious dancing. And some Ginans are composed as if they're Garbis, so you, they're meant to be danced. And one peer, the Spear Shams, has a whole series of these Garbis. And here, very interestingly, said the spiritual guide has danced to the Gurbi and narrated the teachings of the Quran. So here the Ginans that this peer is composed in the form of Gurbi are seen as, in fact, the teachings of the Quran. So there's this very, you find these references to this Quranic discourse in here, but always in the vernacular. And I can go on giving you lots and lots of examples about Quranic language, metaphor, symbols, but being expressed in a local form. Now, you also have things from the Quran, the story of creation being told in Indian language through this poetic discourse of the Ginans. Now, obviously, when you start see, looking at the Ginans, so think about all these themes that are in there. And then you find the connections with all these other traditions right, with the bhakti tradition, the sun tradition, the way things are recited, sung, so on, the, some of the literary conventions, the symbols, the metaphors, they're all shared. But what makes them distinctive is they're talking about devotion to this imam. Um, uh, I'm not, I'm just going to sort of summarize this, but the core of this message that is there is that you need to follow the teachings of the satpant, which are follow a righteous lifestyle, practice meditation to receive enlightenment, and participate in the rituals of the congregation. Stress on interior religion. Rituals are useless. Performing rituals doesn't get you anywhere. The most important thing is to find the guide, the satguru, who's the imam, and the importance of remembering the name, and the ultimate reward is enlightenment. And the imam is there referred in so many different terms, some Indic terms, some Arabic terms, some Persian terms, some Sufi terms, some Sant terms, all kinds of vocabulary is being used. Now, when scholars started studying these traditions, they didn't know what to make out of this. So just to give you, I'll, I'll highlight one of my favorite characterizations. Here's Aziz Ahmed. This is a syncretistic state sect of indeterminate religious identity, a curiosity of mushroom religious growth. We just can't categorize them. Or Ivanov, this is a transition between Ismailism, Sufism, and Hinduism. And you know, when you see Ismailism, Hinduism, these are Western constructions of religion as ideology of identity, and it's being imposed on that. And then there are others who say, well, this isn't really a, 
a mishmash, there is actually some sort of synthesis taking place here. Uh, I can talk about this later because this does have huge implications in the age of colonialism and post-colonialism. When the British are trying to identify, are you Muslim or are you Hindu? Which group are you? And people would say, we are both. What do you mean? You can't be both. You have to be one. And this causes all kinds of issues, as we will see. Now, just to give you a sense, let's play some recitation. So I'm going to play you this first one. This one is in, um, it says, Nara Nakalanki Keriwat. Nakalanki is the tenth avatar of Vishnu. Ali has come as the tenth. So only a few people know who this avatar Nakalanki is, the Imam Ali. And who knows this? One who has met the true guru, the guide. And then, of course, there's a mention of Muhammad, that, that you know, that this, the guru is connected with Muhammad. Uh, and then, of course, the connection with Ali in the Shia context. And then this third verse, that this Shah, this master, lives in the West, Pacham. In, and he has an Ajumi form. Ajumi means Persian form. He's not Arab, he's Persian, he's Iranian. And he speaks Farsi. All right. So just to give you a, a sense of what this sounds like. Narayana Kailanka Kevi Vata Koi Kajave Ji Narayana Kailanka Kevi Vata Koi Kajave Ji Jeve Sata Gura Mali Asa Raso Hippi Jaive Ji Sata Gura Sata Kari Jara Mohammed Rupe Ji Sata Gura Sata Kari Jara Mohammed Rupe Ji I jani rinjana shama sada ya ali rupe ji shaha betha pai chama desha I jami rupe ji shaha betha Pai Chamadesha Ajami Rupe. So you have this kind of a discourse. But here's another here's another very another kind of discourse which is very mystical and it's talking about the spiritual journey and the quest. This one says, realize your true identity and meditate on the name of your Lord. Renounce selfishness and ward of the five passions, that is desire, lust, greed, all these materialist thing things, and fix your heart on illallah. And this illallah is an abbreviation of the first part of the Muslim shahada, the profession of la ilaha illallah, there is no God but God. And in a mystical way, the la ilaha, there is no God, is seen as the negation and then illallah is an affirmation. What is being negated in the first part? The human ego. And what is being affirmed is God. So it's saying that you should go from being egocentric and selfish and self-centered to God-centric, right? And cultivate within you God-like God qualities. So here's, I'll play you just this one. So you see another sort of rag Aparu Apa Picha Ej 
ਜੀ ਪੰਜ ਵਾਰ gives you a sense of what this sounds like and of course this is a very important part of worship so this is every, people recite it in the jamaat khanas as part of the ceremonies but also people have cassettes and CDs and you find internet sites you can find ginans everywhere so you hear them in the homes and so on and there's a whole industry now of people uh, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes of ginans not just as worship but beyond worship and people have written about the impact this has had on their lives how this has been transformative i gave you an example of somebody who was transformed by ginan here is this very famous pakistani writer and poet gulam ali alana who also talks about how transformative this ginan recitations were especially those he used to hear from his mother who used to sing them as lullabies to him while he was falling asleep and how he picked up things you know on that what is very interesting in this ginan is that the music the rasa so those of you are familiar with indian music systems know that there is a a rasa that the artist is trying to evoke a certain mood and emotion in the audience through his art and the mood and the evoke and the emotion that he's trying to evoke matches is supposed to match the content of the poem and thus when you know you can evoke emotions of joy sadness pain and so on and these subtleties become very important and people are moved only by the proportion of their sensitivity sensitivity to music and this is again those of you familiar with fine arts the different type of moods that can be invoked um uh but just to show you that there is a connection between the text itself the music the raga and the rasa the mood that it's trying to uh trying to evoke how are we doing for time 10 minutes okay all right good now they meet people who sort of worked on the ginans on how they how they actually work in a performance context where uh you have you know the text some people memorize the text these interesting these melodies are not written down so there's no notation it's transmitted orally so if you don't know how to sing it it's too bad you have to learn it from somebody who does right uh and this also creates a problem because different people have different ideas of what's the official rag of this ginan and if there are two rags there's a competition no i'm right so you're wrong very interesting things anyway so there is this the whole act of trying to memorize and sing and so on uh and then through the process of singing bringing meaning to the individual but also bringing meaning to the whole congregation and when you have a whole congregation maybe of 3 4000 people singing the same ginan it can be a very powerful experience for people now so this was this tradition as it evolved in the pre modern period in the 19th and late 20th century major changes took place in the community and its environment now i can't go into all this the impact of this but this had an impact on the ginans uh for example i mentioned alluded when the british come into india and they have a very set idea of what's hindu and what's muslim and you have groups like this and they don't know what to put them where do we classify you you've got to belong some place so people are forced into categories um then the imam who used to live in india from uh, who used to live in persia came to india in 1840 that changed the dynamics of the community in india and there were splinter groups and that started having impact on these ginans 
And then after independence of India and Pakistan, religiously based nationalism started to have an impact. So for example, those Ismailis who were in Pakistan and were singing Ginans, other Muslims would look at them and say, this thing sounds very Hindu to us. This is an Islamic. And they'll say, well, what do you mean it's not Islamic? It's talking about the Prophet Muhammad. It's talking about Illallah. No, the language itself. It's too Indian. The melodies are Indian. This is an Islamic. And interestingly, in India, uh, in the early period, where you know the Muslim had become the other, uh, the some of the Indian nationalists loved the Ismailis because they said, these are good Muslims because they are integrated into Indian society. Look at their songs and look at their music. It's just like us. So in different countries, they had very different. In one, there was this idea, who are you? And how can you really be Muslim when you use this kind of language and singing, which we don't recognize? And in India, you get the total opposite. But in India, things changed over time. So. And then you get this diaspora, the migration of people from the subcontinent to East Africa, to Europe, North America. And then you have the revolution in media technology. All of this, as a package, started to have an impact on this tradition. Now, if I started to talk to you about all the different ways it's impacted, you'd be here the rest of the night. So I'm not going to go into that. But what I do want to talk about is this revolution in media technology and the diaspora, that people moving out of India, and what happens to this tradition when it is in Canada, when it is in America, when it is in Britain, and so on. And for this, I'm actually referring to a dissertation uh, by Karim Gilani, uh, written in 2012, where he talks about sound recitation of Koja Ismaili Ginan's traditions and transformations. Now, one of the things you see that has happened to this tradition, that on the one hand, there is the, the traditional sort of use, you know, in the, in the context of worship, in the Chamatkana, people still recite it. There are certain Ginans that people won't sing, but there, this is very much, con that old tradition continues with some modification. But but then you have this whole other new trend where you have all kinds of people trying to sing Ginan. Some of them are Ismaili, some of them are non-Ismaili, and I'll give you some examples. The media, the internet, YouTube, globalization, new teaching methods, Sufi and Bollywood influences, everything starts influencing this, this tradition. And very often, it's not within a liturgical context, but outside, uh, contexts that are concert settings, in the setting of new age music, and secular music. So let me give you an example. So you find different types of musicians that are now trying to sing Ginan. So you have traditional trained professional musicians who are not Ismaili, are so captivated by the Ginans. For example, Abida Parveen, who some of you may know is Pakistan's great Sufi singer. She loves the Ginans and she recites them as part of her repertoire. Um, you have this Rageshwari Tri Trilok Nomba, who's a, again a very popular Indian singer of Bollywood music, but also sacred music, and she's an actress. She came across the Ginans, and she started to decide to sing the Ginans. And then you have within the community trained Hindu people who've been trained in Indian classical music using new methods they are using this Indian classical music to sing the Ginans and changing the tradition. Then you have people who are trained in Western classical music and trying to apply some things from Western classical music traditions onto the Ginans. And then, of course, you have this new age. And I'm going to give you some examples of some of these. So you can see what's happened to this tradition in the, through these revolutions. It's become part of the world music scene what you might think was a small, obscure tradition of a small, obscure community has become global. So now, I'm just to show you what happens to these texts. 
I'm going to take this one, um, two verses, but we'll only play one verse. This is a very popular ginan, um, <clears throat> which is saying, you know, which is, ex which is exploring, which is um, uh, expressing devotion to Sahib, the Lord. And we don't know who the Lord is. The Lord could be God. The Lord could be the Imam. It's a very ambiguous, who's the Lord that we're talking about, which meant that all kinds of people can sing this and put in their own meaning into it. So I'm going to play you first a traditional way it's sung, all right? This particular piece. And you'll see that there is a slight drone on the background. Uh, and this is sung by a singer who now was born and raised in Zanzibar, where she learned how to sing Ginans, and now lives in Vancouver, Canada. So her name is Anar Kanji. Abida Praveen, who sings Sufi devotional music. And I have a piece here where she's singing uh, this Ginan. And she first, start, she first starts singing a Sufi poem, and then in the middle of the poem, she switches into this, into this Ginan. And um, I'll just play you the, the piece so you can have a look. Uh, just remember the words, but see what she does with the words, right? So. rendition of the same thing, same Gidan, done Bollywood style. <laughs> Oh, 
Now, we move to Canada, and these are the last two examples I'm going to give you of what happens to this tradition in Canada. So I'm first going to uh, play you the same piece done by a group that's called the Chaiwalas. Chaiwala, you know, people who sell chai, but it's the name of a group, if an Ismaili group of singers. And they have, they have created a piece based on this, which I'm going to play you now. So you can have the words again. <laughs> Western skies. I'm blessed with the thought that I will not die. My body may fail, but my soul lives on through the strength and guidance of Hazri Mom. Thus be in my palm and life goes on, right? It helps me see the light, cause without faith, what are we? We're falling, we're starving, I'm carving my thoughts in this coffin. I'm locked in, oh let me free, got me on the path, and I swear I'll never stray off after that. Didn't do this myself, so it must have been, that I've always been on Sarath al Mustaqeem. Sink to my knees and find myself in prayer, no I'm never alone, because you're always there. Okay, so um, I want to play you one more example, but I think I'm going to stop so we have time for questions. But there's even choral music that's developed with Ginans, and you have a choir that's using Western choral style music to sing Ginans, you know, forms to sing Ginans. But I think I'll, so I think this globalization and localization, I'll sort of stop there. But I, I hope I've given you a sense here for a variety of different things, how it's very difficult. Many traditions are so diverse and pluralistic uh, from the pre-modern world, and then when we try to restrict them, to capture, you know, to limit their identities into certain uh, boxes, um, we are actually doing very great harm to the traditions themselves, and that some of these traditions themselves have a universal appeal and a message that get appropriated by people in many different contexts. Um, and that in a certain way, and this goes back to some of, the, some of my own work, what I find very interesting, this is stuff that I've done research on, but I think also about what is most needed in the world today is the capacity to engage across difference. And the arts and music are very powerful tools uh, that have a very, very long history of helping us engage across difference. And what all these examples you're seeing and what's happened to this tradition itself, how it goes from being an obscure little tradition in some villages and has now become global and now connecting with world music traditions, it actually shows that how these ginans have actually become bridges between different cultures. Um, and I should add that some of these ginans have become so popular that we find Hindu groups are singing them in the temples. And a Sikh group I know is singing them in the Gurudwaras because they say, we can read our own meaning into this text. So, so with that, I will stop and then open up for questions.
Thank you so much. We now have time for questions. Please raise your hand and either Wesley or I will come and hand you the mic. Hello, Professor. Thank you for coming. Um, I'd just like to know if you could elaborate a little bit on the connection between uh, uh, the Nizari uh, Ismaili Imam and his role in propagating these Ganans in kind of a modern context. Is he offering some sort of uh, authoritative interpretation of them uh, in the same way he might with a Quranic verse, or is he just endorsing them and like he thinks it's a great so, thing? So interestingly, he, when he talks about them as a wonderful tradition, uh, his grandfather, who was Imam before him, because there was a lot of, in the, so in the early 20th century, when there were all these forces of nationalism and is this really Islamic because it doesn't follow the, what people think is Islamic literature, um, his grandfather made a very interesting statement and he told the community that these Ginans contain the gist of the Quran. They may be a different form, the form, the language, uh, the structure is different from the Quran, but the Quran is in Arabic. And what these peers who compose them is that they are actually teaching you what is the gist and the spirit of the Quran in your language, in your vocabulary, using your metaphors. So there is, uh, and of course the Imam is interpreter of the Quran, but also giving insight. So there's this connection that is there. And uh, I'm actually working on a paper right now that's talking about how this whole tradition is being connected with the, with the Quran. But the tradition itself, the verses that I've talked about, also talk about the Quran as the way, the scripture of the latest age. So it's not only just a, 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 a framework that's being imposed from outside, but it's something from within as well. This actually reminds me of trying to see this tradition as being connected with the Quran or with Islam. This is the same phenomena you see, for example, with Kawali. You know, Kawali is this very powerful Sufi music of South Asia, and a lot of singing and a lot of the symbols of wine intoxicated with the live wine of God and all this. So groups like the Taliban and all these people have a fit when they hear this and say, no, this can't be Islamic, and so on. So when these people who sing Kawali have to, have to get into this discourse with these other groups who think this is not Islamic, what do they say? Oh, this is just a local way of propagating Islam. We are actually doing Islam a great service by preaching its message in the local vernacular, using the music, so we are the guardians of Islam. We have spread Islam in the subcontinent through the Qawwali. So groups like this that find their Islamic identity being challenged very often they turn the argument around and say, no, actually, you know, this tradition have done a great deal of service to Islam and are preaching the real message of Islam. It's, so don't, so we can't, you know, um, uh, discount them. The same thing, by the way, also happened to Rumi because he wrote this long Persian verse, the Masnavi, long poem, and it's written in Persian. And Jami, the great Persian poet, called it the Quran in Persian because it's seen as containing the gist of the Quran. And much of what Rumi writes about the, the Islamic experience in the Quran is personal and it's mystical. And obviously some of the people who have a more legalistic or more philosophical notion of Islam have issues with the Masnavi. But it's become, so again, this idea of using the vernacular as seen as a kind of a secondary scripture between the community and the main scripture, the Quran. It's a, it's a common sort of trope that you find within Muslim literature. Okay. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I was actually born in Kenya, and my mom went to Aga Khan High um, when she was in high school. but. Um, my question is relating to the Ganans. Um, are they sung in like mosque after, like f as prayer, and are like the more modern versions like included in some services, or does it depend like city to okay. city? Okay. So they are sung. They are very much part of ritual worship. So just as you go into a church and you go to hymns, you have this. This is part of the liturgy. 
So they'll have these prayers in Arabic, the ritual prayers in Arabic, and then in between they will have these, and sometimes as a prelude to that, they'll sing these kinans. Now, what's been interested in that ritualistic context, there's a, developed a very strict control of how you can sing it. So they don't allow musical instruments anymore because they'll say, well, if you do, in the past we know that the Ginans were sung with musical instruments, but now if you try to do this, there are going to be other Muslims that are going to call you, oh, you're kafir because you're singing this to music. So outside the ritual context, they will sing it to music, but inside the ritual context, they don't. Uh, and then, of course, there are sort of self-appointed guardians within the community, people who just, this community policing, oh, you sung this, and this sounds like a Bollywood tune. Don't make this into a Bollywood. And so you get that kind of self-control taking place. But outside, all kinds of experimentation take place. Um, hello, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, considering that um, Islam is a monotheistic religion and Hinduism has many, many gods, how did the Isla uh, Ismaili Muslims feel about um, the Vaishnavites making their Ali and their, um, basically their prophet, yeah, yeah. a part of a cycle sure. of many, many gods? Like, yeah. How do they feel about that? Okay, it's a very interesting question. So one interesting aspect of Ismaili thought, and this goes back to many centuries, uh, the Ismailis in their thought make a distinction between what they call the exoteric and the esoteric. The Arabic term is the zahir and the batin. And they, f in, their th in their thinking, the worldview, is that when you look with the eye, the physical eye, and you're looking at the material world, you see plurality and multiplicity and you see difference. But underlying all that material difference, if you are able to look beyond the physical, beyond the exoteric, into the esoteric, into the botan, you will find that there is an existential unity. And the Ismailis are sort of, were renowned for this notion of the botan. And Everything there's a botan. There's a botan of the Quran, which the Imam knows. There's a botan of nature. There's a botan behind all kinds of stories. So, because they thought about the botan in everything, they were called the botaniya, the people of the botan. But this had interesting consequences on the theology. So, in different regions, different parts of the world, for example, in the 11th, in the 10th, 11th century in Egypt you find Ismaili writers trying to explain the notion of the Imam using on the one hand Neoplatonic thought, Gnostic thought, Zoroastrian thought, uh, and then they also were looking at the traditional sort of legal systems that the Sunnis had developed, like you know the pillars of Islam, and developed their own version, and they used that framework as well. So one of the things that you find in this tradition, because of its view that there's an underlying existential unity. If only you're able to see with the heart. With the eye, you see multiplicity, but if you see with the heart, if you have that insight, you will recognize that unity. That has meant that they, are, they have this ability to be able to express their ideas and thoughts in multiple discourses. Uh, so what happened in India, if you look at the larger history, yeah, it makes total sense. And the fact that the tradition could use Sufi discourse, Vaishnavite discourse, Quranic discourse, Bhakti discourse, Sant discourse, to explain similar sets of ideas from a point of view of Ismaili thought, yeah, this is what it is. But if you look at it from the outside, uh, people say, oh, this is, I gave you some quotes, right, from scholars. It's, it's just a question of how you look at things. Uh, so this is, I would say, one of the interesting things about this tradition within Islam. Uh, it's a minority tradition, but it's been able to think about the connection between the material and the spiritual in a very open way. And part of it is to do with, because it resists, um, ritualization or thinking that rituals are important, it's resisted in a certain way even legalistic 
that Islam, they don't say Islam is law. Islam is about the intellect. So it's a whole different framework, right? And that would explain how they could look at this and say that there's nothing wrong in saying that Krishna and Rama and so on and so forth were predecessors of Ali. It's just in that it's a different framework. So this is kind of a, a general question, but with Halloween coming up, cultural appropriation is kind of on the minds of a lot of uh, college students. And me personally, as a Japanese American, I've always kind of viewed uh, cultural appropriation is a good thing, and it led to the integration of Japanese American people. Um, but I was wondering, and you've shown us that cultural appropriation can be constructive. I was wondering, kind of you personally, how, where do you draw the line between destructive cultural appropriation and constructive cultural appropriation? Yeah, interesting. So this is a big debate, uh, I mean, within the community, because, you know, there was a, there was a, a tendency to use Bollywood music to sing Ginans. So people would totally discard what the traditional things were and they would use. And people felt that that was going a little bit too far. Because some of the examples that I gave you, they more or less, they might change sort of the musical framework a little bit, but the rod, the melody, even the, the chai walas, you know, when they sang the Ginan, they still sang it to the rod. Maybe they, they, they quickened the beat but they still kept that. So there is this kind of sense that so long as you're, so long as you're keeping some of the basics there, then you're allowed experimentation. But if the basic rag is distorted, then people start saying, well, then you're going too far. And why are they so concerned with that? Because I mentioned the connection with the melody, with the rasa, the mood. So because this connection with poetry, the message of the poetry, the rag, and the mood it's supposed to evoke is so closed, there, there are some people put boundaries to this appropriation. But I think, you know, for things like this, when you, uh, when you see this, I think it's inevitable when a religious tradition travels in different cultural contexts that necessarily parts of it are going to be reinterpreted because religion is embedded in political, economic, literary, artistic context. And it's always going to respond. That's the nature of religion. It's going to be dynamic. And you can try to hold on to, okay, the past, but then you'll find the younger generation, you know, is gonna have a hard time relating to this. So, if, so in some cases, I think in the case of religion and appropriation of cultural things that uh, if they're done with sensitivity which I think some of these groups are, even the Chaiwalas, I've interviewed them, and they're very religious, you know, they are, and when you listen to what they're actually rapping about, it has a very deep religious content, right? So then people say, oh, so that's fine, but I think that um, it's, for me, it's inevitable that you're gonna find this, and I think when you look at Christian musics or even Jewish musics and so on, you find this adaptation taking place. It's only natural. question. Okay. Please join me in one more time thanking our speaker, Ali Asani. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.